Well, in our first lesson this morning, Alan talked about Bible study and what Bible study does for us, why we should be motivated to do more Bible studying, that it's not just about knowing things about God, like studying a textbook or an encyclopedia, but really knowing God and letting the Bible be a guide to every part of our lives. So if Alan talked about the need for Bible study, what I would like to do in my list is talk about the how of Bible study, as in tips for effective Bible studying. The other night, Chad did an invitation where he mentioned Monty Python and quoted from Monty Python. I'm going to do him one up and quote from a The Onion article. If anybody's not familiar with that, The Onion is a satirical news agency on the internet where they take ridiculous things and, and write ridiculous articles about them. And one thing that I liked recently was an article from The Onion called Nation Shudders at Large Block of Uninterrupted Text. It says, unable to rest their eyes on a colorful photograph or, or bold type. Uh, it goes on to say here, I actually wanted to quote from one particular passage here. It says, dumbfounded citizens from Maine to California gazed helplessly at a chunk of frightening text, unsure of what to do next, without an illustration, chart, or embedded YouTube video to ease them in. Millions were frozen in place terrified by the sight of one long, unbroken string of English words. Now, of course, the Onion's being silly about that. They're being satirical. But it did get me thinking, like, are we really that far away from that? Are we really a whole lot better in terms of our ability to read large blocks of uninterrupted English text than that? The article goes on to jokingly say, from one Boston resident... Why won't it just tell me what it's about? There are no bullet points, no highlighted parts. I've looked everywhere. There's nothing here but words. Do you become panic-stricken when you open up the Bible? Because the Bible is a lot like that, isn't it? There's no pictures. There's no bullet points. There's a lot of narrative. There are genealogies. Oh man, when you get to the book of Exodus and Leviticus, watch out! So do you know the Bible as well as you should? Do you appreciate the Bible as well as you should? And do you even have the tools in your mind to study the Bible in an effective and meaningful way? On a more serious note, one writer said in an article called The Epidemic of Bible Illiteracy, in our churches. This is written by Ed Stetzer from Christianity Today magazine. He writes, When was the last time you read a book? For almost one in four of us, it was more than a year ago, according to Pew Research. That's three times the number who didn't read a book in 1978. In America, we have a literacy problem. But more concerning to me, we have a biblical literacy problem. Americans, including churchgoers, aren't reading much of any book, including the good book. Christians claim to believe the Bible is God's word. We claim it's God's divinely inspired, inerrant message to us. Yet despite this, we aren't reading it. A recent LifeWay research study found only 45% of those who regularly attend church read the Bible more than once a week. Over 40% of the people attending read their Bible occasionally, maybe once or twice a month. Almost one in five churchgoers say they never read the Bible, which is essentially the same number who read it every day. Because we don't read God's Word, it follows that we don't know God's Word. And we really don't have any excuses, do we, when it comes to Bible literacy? Nine out of ten American families own a Bible. Many American families own several Bibles. And even for those who are totally unfamiliar with the Bible, all you have to do is download it for free on your iPhone. We don't have an excuse for not knowing things about the Bible, especially things that are most essential to our faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God who died for our sins and was raised from the grave to defeat death for all of us. If we don't know things about the Son of God, 
Why do we expect to live the faith that we claim to believe? Some are quick to blame things like technology, and I suppose there is some merit to that. Our attention spans have decreased rapidly over the last few years due to poor reading habits and overexposure to bite-sized information. We like things to be fast and on the go and accessible by smartphone and easily digestible. Like this Onion article was saying, people are in a panic when they actually have to sit down and read things instead of just having highlighted quotes, bullet points, or a short YouTube video. If it's not being presented to us in a couple of minutes, it might as well be not be presented to us at all. And perhaps along the same lines, one element of our poor Bible study is technology. Whether it's technology that distracts us from Bible studying altogether, or it's technological aids that we believe are helping us in our Bible study, but are actually keeping us from digging in a little bit deeper. And by the way, this is not a knock at anybody who reads the Bible on a smartphone or a tablet, okay? Please understand me when I say that. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing sinful with it. It's not necessarily a bad thing. But I do wonder, and this is just my opinion, I do wonder, have we lost something when we go from having our Bible on the same piece of technology that we play Angry Bird on? the same piece of technology that we throw, throw around and let our kids play with, the, the same piece of technology that, that is easily disposable and replaceable every single year when the new model comes out. Have we lost something when we're reading the Bible on that same piece of technology and not just reading a Bible? There is something to be said about turning a page with your fingers, of marking a page with a note, of getting a highlighter out and actually tangibly interacting with your Bible. There is something to be said about that when it comes to a dusty Bible collecting dust on the bookshelf. Whatever the obstacles might be, if we want to know God's will, then we must seek it in the written word. And this is a lesson today that I hope that we can come to explain, that we can come to understand together. The first thing we need to do is recognize the need. And this is a little bit of what Alan talked about this morning, so we'll go through this section of the lesson uh, pretty fast. We need to recognize that we need to study the Bible. If you're not studying the Bible, recognize that you need to study it. Many of us simply wander aimlessly through life. We are blissfully ignorant of deeper and more meaningful truths that are right at our fingertips. And perhaps Satan uses this to derail the Christian more than any other thing. He uses this tactic because it requires very little effort on everybody's part. We just don't feel like we need it. We're just not interested in it. We're, we're bored even with Bible study. I guess ask yourself, how many hours have you spent studying the Bible in a given week? And then how many hours do you spend in various carnal activities? Jesus Himself states, that anybody who loves family or friends more than him is not worthy of him. Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 and 38. So where have you placed your priorities? Consider what is at stake. We'll go through these pretty quickly to move on to the next part of our lesson. Bible study is linked with discipleship. In Matthew chapter 28, in the, in the Great Commission, Jesus tells his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel and to teach them all that I have commanded. That when you teach people what Jesus commands, you're able to make disciples of all the nations. Bible study, then, is a part of our becoming His disciples. Bible study affects salvation, Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Notice what the power of the Word is, what the power of God is. It's the Gospel. And that's why we're not ashamed of the Gospel, because it is the power of God unto salvation. Bible study shows that you're approved by God. Notice, I want to read this one in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. Follow along, if you will, in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. How do you handle accurately the word of truth if you don't know the word of truth? That takes Bible study. Bible study is the prescription for the problems of this life. Prescribe and teach these things. 
Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 11. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 17, Bible study equips us for every good work. You want to know how to do good works in this life, to be ready to do those good works? Well, it comes through Bible study. It equips us for those things. Bible study gives us a connection to the past. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus is in one of the synagogues there preaching out of the book of Isaiah. And he says, this scripture, this prophecy has come true in your hearing today. Bible study connects us to the truths and the great things of the past. It helps us understand the role of prophecy. It helps us understand how things written 2,000 years ago still have incredible application to our culture today. Bible study teaches us lessons, as was read earlier in our worship service out of Romans 15 and verse 4. Read about those great men and women of old from the Scriptures and learn lessons from them. Bible study builds faith. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the Word of God. Trace it back then. Without hearing the Word of God, do you ever build faith in your life? Bible study opens up our eyes to the mystery of salvation. When you read, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, when you read what I wrote to you before, then you will know the mystery. The mystery that has now been shown, the mystery that is now known, that salvation is brought to the Gentiles. When you study the Bible, when you study what Paul and Peter and James and John wrote, you have access to apostolic, divine knowledge of the mystery of salvation. Do you want to study the Bible? I think these are reasons enough, don't you? Maybe one of the obstacles that you face is that you believe that Bible study just isn't something worth your time now. You can put it off till later. That I'll always have time when I retire, when I'm not working anymore, when the kids are grown up and the kids leave the house. Then I'll have all of that free time to sit and study my Bible. I'll turn one of the kids' rooms into a study. And I'll have a globe in the corner. And, and, and there'll be mahogany in there. And I'll finally be able to sit and read the Bible in a red leather chair, just like I always wanted to. Eternity is on the line, my friends. Unfortunately, many of us don't want to study Bible, don't want to study the Bible because it just doesn't seem like an important task right now. And for what it is, it seems laborious and unrewarding for the moment. Some see it as a boring book that doesn't apply to us today. However, the Bible plainly teaches that the world is going to be judged by its words. John 12 and verse 48. I didn't come to judge the world, Jesus says. There's one thing that will judge this world. My words will be the standard of judgment at the end of the world. Any departure from what the Bible teaches is a departure from God. So if you don't know the Bible, you don't know God. First, uh, 2 John verses 9 and 10 talks about that. That if you're not familiar with the teaching of Christ, you're not familiar with Christ. Those who obey the word are people who will be saved, but those who disobey will be sorry that they wasted the opportunity. John 3 and verse 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. And how do you know God? How do you learn about God? How do you obey God? How do you know what it is that's expected of you if you don't know the word? We need to have a very clear understanding that the Bible is for the purpose of understanding God and living an obedient life. Be very careful not to put the Bible on the back burner. Be very careful not to save it for later, because later might not come. Is Bible study only for the elite? There are many of us who want to believe that only certain elite individuals have the ability to even understand the Bible. And maybe you don't study the Bible because you just don't think that it's accessible for you. Maybe you think that only experts can handle the Bible. Maybe you think that it's okay to go ahead and let Ryan handle Bible stuff for you. 
that if you have a question, we'll just go to Alan. We'll see what Alan has to say. And we'll just trust that Ryan and Alan or the elders know what they're talking about when it comes to the Bible. How could I possibly read it and understand it? How could I, without any knowledge of Greek or Hebrew, I don't know all the historical background behind all of the books. I read some words in there. I don't even know what the definition of some of those words are. How can I understand the Bible when I'm not an elite person? And I didn't go to seminary and I don't have a theology degree. Well, guess what? Let me level with you. I didn't go to a seminary and I don't have a theology degree either. Alan went to the Marines and he learned everything he needed to know there. I went to Disneyland. <laughs> Do you have to be a preacher or a professor or a religious scholar, though, to have a completely healthy understanding of the Bible? In fact, more often than not, it's the smartest people of the world who have the most difficult time understanding it because of intellectual pride. Now, that's not everybody, and this is not anti-intellectualism that I'm trying to preach to you. But I do find that with a lot of people I meet, the smarter you are, the harder time you have accepting some of the very simple, plain truths of the Bible. And there's some pretty simple things in the Bible. There's some, some pretty obvious things that some of the smartest people in the world cannot seem to grasp. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And notice what the Apostle Paul has to say about the wise men of this age and this world and their approach to the Bible. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 20. Let's start in verse 20 for context here. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 20. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the great debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. He goes on in verse 26. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. Now what he's saying is that the gospel has some pretty ridiculous things by the world's standards. The gospel asks us to believe that Jesus, a man who lived 2,000 years ago, died and was raised from the dead. And if you ask any great atheist debater, Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens or any of them, the resurrection is, to, is their great sticking point. You believe that you are going to be raised from the dead. And that faith is based upon what you believe to be the fact of Jesus being raised from the dead. Even though, medically, we know that you cannot be raised from the dead. So we're asked to believe in the resurrection of the dead. And science and intellectualism and anybody who has a brain in 21st century America clearly does not believe in the resurrection from the dead. Such a thing is so essential to our faith, though that it makes us look foolish compared to the world. And yet, I like the way Paul puts it. God says it pleased God that such a foolish thing would not only be rejected by the world, but accepted by those who have the simple and humble faith of a little child. It pleased God to save the world by something that seems so stupid to the world. That pleases God. You know why it pleases God? I think a good explanation. It pleases God because it means the gospel is accessible to everybody. From the very smartest people who are humble enough to accept something on faith to those who are not the smartest people, which is really all the rest of us. The gospel is accessible to all. The gospel has a message that anybody can accept and you don't have to have a degree and you do not have to be an intellectual to understand that God sent His Son to die for you, that you might have heaven. I like in Luke 10, verse 21, the, the way Jesus puts it. Same kind of mentality here. I praise Thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that Thou didst hide these things from the wise and intelligent, and didst reveal them to babes. So maybe you don't have a theology degree. In some ways, it's probably better that you don't have a theology degree. Because it means that you're simply reading the Bible. 
as God created you. You're reading the Bible with the brain that God gave you. You are reading the Bible as a person coming to God, not through the lens of a school, not through the lens of a, of a group of intellectuals, not through the lens of a degree, not through the lens of what somebody else tells you what to believe or a belief system. You're simply reading the Bible. And if it says it on the page, you are able to understand it. Be excited about the brain that God gave you. Because in Psalm 139, verse 14, the writer says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God made you in a way to understand His Word. You can understand it. You must understand it. It is not inaccessible. When studying the Bible, believe in yourself. Have some confidence that you can read something on a page and that you're smart enough to get what it says. Have some confidence that when you read in Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, that that is not such a complicated and convoluted idea that you cannot understand it. That God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in His name shall be saved. You can get that. I think you can, and God thinks you can. More important than intelligence is an honest heart. And I promise you, God would rather have the foolish of this world by world standards and an honest heart than the great men and the great debaters and the great intellectuals of this world and moral and intellectual arrogance. Even though men like Peter and the sons of Zebedee were not educated, they were nothing but blue-collar fishermen, they had honest hearts when the gospel came to them. A love for truth will always be more vital than a love for intelligence. Give me, here's a few verses for you to think about on this point. John 14 and verse 15. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Jesus never said, if you're smart enough to understand them, you'll keep my commandments. He says, if you love me, if you love God, you'll understand his commandments and you'll keep them. John 7 verse 17. If any man is willing to do his will, he shall know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak for myself. If you're willing to do God's will, you will know the teaching. It will be accessible to you. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. John 18, verse 37. If you love truth, and if you desire truth, and if you're actually honestly looking for truth, you'll hear the voice of God. Luke 8, verse 15. These are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. God wants honesty. God wants humility. He'll always take that, no matter how smart or dumb you think you are. So let's look at some practical tips for effective Bible study, some hints for you to consider. If you want to study the Bible more, you want to study it in a more effective way, here's some things to think about. Use simple Bible passages to interpret more difficult ones. Sometimes you're reading through the Bible and you hit a passage and you're just scratching your head wondering what could God possibly be talking about. Other times you're reading the Bible and you find a verse that seems to almost stand on its own or contradict another Bible verse and you wonder how could that Bible verse possibly fit in the Bible when I have other concepts that seem to contradict it. Well, the thing you need to do is use simple Bible verses to interpret more difficult Bible verses. We might be reading through the book of Romans and we might be reading a whole lot in the book of Romans about faith and how faith justifies us before God. And if all we're reading is, and I admit it, Romans I think is the hardest book in the New Testament. You might think Revelation is. Revelation to me is a, is a walk in the park compared to Romans. Romans gets me every time I read it and I'm always scratching my head. Even in all these years, Romans is still one of those books of the Bible that I have to work hard to understand. But you might be reading through Romans and you might be very, very confused about the role of faith. You might be very, very confused about the sovereignty of God. You might be very, very confused about Romans chapter 9 and what is God doing judging things as, as, a, as a clay pot and worthy of disposing it and I'll judge who I judge and have mercy on whom I have mercy. You know what's great? There are some very simple Bible passages that you can turn to, to that shed light 
on the more complicated Bible passages. If you're confused by 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and what God has to say there about divorce and remarriage, start with Matthew 19.9. Right? Just start with Matthew 19.9. That one's a pretty simple verse. If you're confused about marriage and divorce, start with Matthew 19.9 and work your way from there. If you're confused about baptism, and what's the role of baptism? I don't understand what it is. You know what? Start with Acts 2, verse 38. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins in order to be saved. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. That's a simple verse. Start with that one. Here's another point. Keep reading. If you're confused by a Bible passage, don't just stop there. Close the Bible and go, oh, man, that was tough. Just keep reading. Because you never know how the next chapter might clarify something. Romans 7 is a tough one for me. Romans 7 is a hard chapter for me. Especially the second half when Paul is talking about this, this hypothetical Paul who seems to always be vacillating between the way of the flesh and the way of the Spirit. And if you're confused by Romans 7, just keep reading. Romans chapter 8 will answer your questions for you. Romans 8 answers your questions. Just keep reading. Remember Dora the fish, just keep swimming? With the Bible, just keep reading. If you have a hard time with a Bible passage, just keep reading. Don't give up because the answer might come in the very next chapter. Always consider context also. To whom is the author writing? Who's the one receiving the letter? When was it written? And always keep the covenant context in mind as well. Does the book of Leviticus apply to us anymore? No, it doesn't. Keep the covenant context in mind. Every word is important and may hold the key to understanding a verse. Be willing to explore words and verses in a very specific way. And if there's a word you don't understand, if the word like justification is a tough word for you, if you're reading along and you see the word sanctify, you might be wondering in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, why does he use the word justified and sanctified in the same verse? Aren't those words the same word? Well, be willing to pull out a Bible dictionary and dig a little bit deeper. And you'll be amazed at the nuance between a lot of these words. Read often as well. Reading the Bible is not like riding a bike. If you stop doing it, you're not able to just pick it up later and pick up where you left off. It's not like riding a bike. Reading the Bible is more like the old adage of use it or lose it. And I felt that in my way when I've studied a book, whether it be an Old Testament book or something like that, Jeremiah. If I haven't studied Jeremiah in one or two years, honestly, I forget a lot of what's in the book of Jeremiah. If I haven't, if I haven't read Leviticus lately, then I'm, I'm going to lose a lot of my knowledge about Leviticus. If I haven't read Hebrews lately, I might not remember what's in Hebrews. Read often. Read often. Study in the right environment, too. Television, children, work, dinner, home repairs, all of these things are otherwise good things. There's nothing sinful or wrong with any of those things, but they can be detrimental to Bible study. Make a resolution, therefore, to set up an environment for yourself that is conducive to effective study habits. If you're going to read the Bible, go into a private room. Close the door. Have some peace and quiet. Tell your children that you need time alone to study. Study while your spouse is out doing something else. Turn off the television or the radio. Turn off the Internet. One person made a really good point the other day that I was talking to you about this very subject, he said that we get very distracted by Facebook. And what we tend to do with Facebook or social media is, or even just with like an e uh, 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 the internet browser open to uh, your email, we'll leave it open or we'll minimize it or something so it's at the bottom of the screen so that we can check the corner of our eye to see, is there anything new on there? And he said that when your brain is focusing on that kind of thing on the side, leaving Facebook open just to see that little red notification thing up in the top corner, or leaving your email open just to see if there's a new one. When our brains are distracted by that thing on the side, we're not really focusing entirely on the task at hand. Facebook can wait. Close it. Turn off the phone. Close the internet browser. 
Walk away from the TV. Those things can wait. If you're going to study the Bible, study it. Study it. And study it. Be wary of easy answers and shortcuts. Maybe you'll hit a passage that's really difficult or a book of the Bible that seems long and boring. You know what the easy answer is? Get on the internet and Google it. What is Jeremiah about? Oh, in one tidy paragraph. I've got the whole book of Jeremiah then. You might start reading Ezekiel and go, oh, <laughs> and that happens. Hey, crack the book of Ezekiel open sometime and you might have a... a but the, the, the easy, lazy thing to do is to just Google, what is Ezekiel about? Don't take the easy answer. Sometimes you've got to slog through it, but it's worth it. It's worth it. And don't depend on technology. Because technology is partially to blame for our predicament. It was reliance on technology and addiction to junk food media that helped foster the impatience for studying and reading that we have today. While there's nothing sinful to be sure about reading the Bible on, again, a smartphone or a tablet or something like that, we need to be so very careful that technology is actually a tool rather than a hindrance. There's something to be said for good old-fashioned Bible study. Not just faith-based blogs or word-a-day calendars or that sort of thing, but good, solid Bible study. The feeling of turning a page, of handling the written word, of writing notes in the margins and highlighting significant passages, these are all great joys that just cannot be measured. Let's bring our lesson to a close with Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 9. And I want you to notice the balance that the writer of Ecclesiastes strikes here when it comes to studying books. Now he says books in general, but I think there's a great passage here, a great lesson to be learned about Bible study itself. He says in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 9, in addition to being a wise man, the preacher, who's the author of Ecclesiastes, also taught the people knowledge. And he pondered and searched out and arranged many proverbs. Do you do the same thing with the Bible? Do you ponder and search out and arrange? Do you find passages that stand out and make notes about them? Do you have a little notebook where you put hmm, interesting passages about the resurrection? Interesting passages about foolishness versus wisdom. Interesting passages about the nature of God and judgment. Do you search out and ponder and arrange Bible passages like that? The preacher sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. Verse 11, the words of wise men are like goads, okay? They poke you along, all right? Cattle prods, okay? They're like goads. And masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd. And maybe in your Bible translation, the word shepherd there is, is uh, capitalized. But beyond this, my son, here's the warning. Be warned. The writing of many books is endless and excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. Striking that balance of I know the Bible, I've studied the Bible, I love the Bible, and living the Bible in real life. That's the challenge. God does not call us to be monks hiding away in a castle in the forest, studying and writing and copying all day long but never living our faith. God does not call you to hide in your room for 12 hours a day studying the Bible, but never going out and teaching it and showing it and living it. Study, yes. Ponder, search out, and arrange. But be very careful, because excessive devotion to that kind of studying, to the detriment of a life lived in the real world around real people, does no good for God. Study the Bible and then live it. Now maybe some of these tips can be very useful for you. If you have more questions, please let me know. Bible study is worth it.
It's worth your time. It's worth your energy. Jesus made it very clear in our Bible class this morning from Matthew chapter 7 that there's two different paths. The wide, easy path leads to destruction. The narrow, difficult path leads to life. Bible study is not always easy. It is challenging at times because of what it says, because it convicts us. But it's a narrow way that leads to life eternal. It's time to take it. Heed what the Bible says and obey Jesus Christ at this time. Whatever needs you might have, please come forward as we stand and sing.